uh, Dean Deborah Nutter and Chairman of the Board Peter, members of faculty, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, we're very honored to have to host this uh, event tonight. And I'm very pleased to learn that, uh, I think uh, you said that nine uh, Indonesian diplomats have been, uh, 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 have gone through your programs. And I think uh, there's a saying now that uh, you know, all of these uh, Fletcher graduates turn out to be, turn out to have great jobs. Uh, one becoming foreign ministers, and others becoming ambassadors and director generals, which is why I'm a bit nervous because I never went to Fletcher. <laughs> Downstairs as a janitor and as a dishwasher. Right. 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 This is a story that before I went there, I was an you know, uh, Indonesian ambassador to the United States. It's always a celebrity. People are interested to know who Indonesia will send. And that is the message of my being here. My message that I tell our young people is that. Yes, uh, the Argentinian basketball team can beat the American dream <laughs> team in the Olympics. Mark Zuckerman can own a billion dollars. A black kid who once went to school in Indonesia can become president of the United States. <laughs> and a dishwasher can become ambassador. <laughs> Mr. Salman, who's standing, uh, sitting in the yeah. I'm not sure that's a good idea, because he's become a lot smarter since <laughs> And every time we have a meeting, uh, and he always begins his sentence with words like, according to what I learned at Fletcher. <laughs> it's, uh, at first it was endearing, and then after a while it became annoying. <laughs> to get your food, uh, but uh, uh, I also became interested. Uh, I asked uh, Khalif, uh, my staff, uh, what, what this program had been uh, talking about uh, in, the, in the last uh, two days or so, and I know the topic is about the world in 2020. And uh, if you don't mind, let me share you uh, my five minutes worth, uh, one minute's worth of what I think about the world uh, in 2020. Uh, Basically, we're talking about the world in the 21st century. And there are few things, few features of that world which I think we should know. First is that I believe one of the main things that the 21st century will be different than the 20th century is that the geopolitical map will not change that much. You know, I come from a country which gained independence in 1945, and we saw a radical uh, change of the geopolitical map a world that started with 50 or 55 countries in the beginning, in spent 198 countries, probably even more. I forget the last count. But I hope that number stays, uh, or doesn't go that far uh, from where it is now. Because I think if you have 10 or 15 more countries becoming uh, uh, independent, uh, that is a sign that we will see a much more turbulent world. So I think uh, a part, a key part of that 21st century world will be how we are able to maintain stability of geopolitical map. Perhaps Kosovo, perhaps Palestine, we hope Palestine will become an independent state. Maybe one or two more, but hopefully not too many more for the state of international stability. Another part, and this is what I feel uh, in, in my daily job uh, in diplomacy, uh, you really feel in the last, you know, since the crumbling of the world, a Cold War order, a realignment of, of interests. Uh, uh, countries' interests now are uh, being realigned to the extent that the geopolitics are changing. And this is what we've seen with Indonesia's relationship with America, for example. You know, in the 50s, there was a government that 
fell in Indonesia because he wanted to pursue a uh, military cooperation with the United States. Right? But now, uh, 20 years after the Berlin Wall collapsed, President Didoino himself is proposing a strategic partnership with the United States. Why? Because so much of our interests have changed and realigned. You know, uh, so much of the regional and global issues dealing with terrorism, dealing with diseases, de dealing with people smuggling, de dealing with climate change, uh, uh, and all, a whole lot of other things. These are compelling us to work together and team the strategic <coughs> landscape. And the big question that we still need to face is whether or not there will be more geopolitics of competition or more geopolitics of cooperation. But my president believes that I think there's time for us to evolve the geopolitics more towards geopolitics of cooperation. I mean, we're seeing signs of it. We're seeing in the uh, East Asia how America, Russia, the two Koreas are working together to deal with the nuclear issue. And when we have the tsunami, we see how the militaries of the United States, China, India, uh, Islamic countries, Australia, and ASEAN are working together uh, to help uh, tsunami uh, victims. You know, all these things, little by little, we hope will introduce more geopolitics of cooperation and less geopolitics uh, of competition. The other feature I think which is important is the pace of change. Uh, you know, 20th century, they say, was a very revolutionizing era, but I think the 21st century is going to be very tremendous in terms of pace. I, I think what Farid Zakaria said uh, that uh, things will change in the next 10 years more than they have in the last 100 years is, is, is quite true. Uh, and one, one anecdotal thing that I saw was when we visited Shenzhen uh, with my president. And that really opened my eyes because Shenzhen 20 years ago was a fishing village of 200,000 people, right? And just in a matter of 20, 30 years, it became a metropolitan city of 20 million people, one of the best performing economies in China and, and, and in Asia. The lesson for us, for developing countries, for Africa, for Asia, for East, for Middle East, is that you can change in one generation. You know, the founding fathers of Indonesia believe that this prosperity business probably will take 10 generations to, to achieve. But no, you know, in the 21st century, I think you can, with good governance, with political will, with intelligent allocation of resources, achieve change in one generation. Another feature of the 21st century world, I think, is the rise of what I would call the global conscience. Right? And we felt this, you know, we felt this when we had the tsunami. The whole world cried. You know, uh, I was informed that one third of the American household contributed one way or another to the tsunami victims. And I think this is, without being able to provide the facts or statistics, you know, the rise of this conscience, uh, uh, the fact that people care about causes larger than, than, than their own immediate needs and um, larger and farther than their own immediate uh, community. These are the things that I think uh, will be a, a key force uh, driving not just national politics, but global uh, politics. And which is why I believe that the 21st century if will be different than the 20th century in that the 20th century is a hard power century. You know, we have two world wars, many regional wars, many proxy wars. Probably more people died in the 20th century, they said, than any other century before. But the 21st century, I believe, will be a soft power century. And I think this is something that uh, we all need to work on to make sure that it becomes a reality. Now, the, the other and probably the last feature that I noticed about the 21st century is that I think the key term, the key term will be something not really sexy, but uh, something that we see all the time. That the key term will be multi, you know, multi. Uh, multinational, multilinguistic, multi-system, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-this and multi-that. I mean, when you go to the airport, you see what I'm talking about. When you do your own governance, you see what, what, what I'm talking about. Which is why I think the best way for us to function in that multi-world is by uh, embracing connectivity, which is the new jargon of our generation. This is certainly the term that is uh, sweeping the way Indonesians think about ourselves, how to have domestic connectivity and also international connectivity. And I think this is a term that if we do well, 
will help to transform uh, the world in ways that we've never seen uh, before. And this is certainly what Indonesia is trying to do. With the pace of change that we are seeing, Indonesia is trying to be adaptable. <coughs> because we believe that most, the best countries in the world will not be necessarily the strongest countries, but the most adaptable countries. We try to be the most connected, connected countries uh, along with other countries in, in the region. Uh, we are uh, trying also to uh, uh, help solidify the geopolitics of cooperation in the region uh, through what we call the ASEAN community, uh, whereby ASEAN will be transformed into uh, a, a community of three pillars, ASEAN political security community, economic community, and social uh, community. Um, that is my short take of what I think the 21st century world uh, will look like. Uh, I think probably some of these things will be wrong, but hopefully not. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, I'm very pleased to have all of you here. I'm very pleased that all of you are thinking hard about these issues, about what the world would look like. You ask us what we can do together. I have an idea. Uh, we've been thinking hard about having a conference on futurology uh, in Indonesia. Uh, about how uh, people from East and West uh, read the future. And I was wondering if uh, Fletcher might be interested in working with us to, 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 to work on that conference on futurology. Again, enjoy your dinner, and I'm very pleased to have all of you here. Thank you very much.